Hi everyone, I'm going to start this new series of the Yal Kut Yosef, which I've been uh, talking about for the last few months. Finally, we are getting there at the moment, and uh, Bezir Hashem, I don't know how, it's, how long it's going to take, it could take a year. Wherever you're listening from social media, it's very important to learn Hilchot Shabbat, it's very, very crucial. I spoke about it in my introduction, but finally we are going to actually start it now. I'm going to start off with a general introduction in this first part, and as we're going to move on, we're going to going through the different simanim and now today we're actually discussing today uh within regards to the general rules of the halachot of shabbat itself so i gave the previous introduction where i gave some tidbits on it and now finally we are starting over here the klalim but malachot shel shabbat we know that on shabbat there's 39 different malachot that uh you know is forbidden and uh we're going to expound on the general halachot to start off this series over here. So we'll start off on Aleph, that is obviously number one. Some of you might be very, very learned listening. Some of you might be a total beginner. So I'll try and uh, please everyone at the same time because we've got a very, very broad uh, audience over here. And Bezer Hashem, together we are going to learn the Halachot of Shabbat and very, very crucial. So I'll start off Aleph. This Klalim Bamelachot Shabbat. Aleph, I'll say it in Hebrew and in English. Because if I'm just going to say it in Hebrew, Many people might not understand, but also if we say it in English, everyone's going to understand also. But there's some intrinsic value when you read it, the Hebrew itself, even if one doesn't actually understand what they're saying. But uh, I'll say it in both. So please, everyone, listen and uh, enjoy this. Aleph. Shvita b'shvi'i memlacha mitzvah asehi shne'emar o b'yom shvi tishbot. This is actually quoting. Uh, from a pasuk in Sefer Shemot in Chaf Kimel Yud Bet, v'kol ha'ose bo melacha bitel mitzvah ase lishbot melacha biyom Shabbat. V'avar al lo tase shneimar. Quoting the pasuk again in uh, Shemot Chaf, lo tase kol melacha. Umahu chayav al asiyat melacha bizman shebet mikdash kiyam im ase beretzono im ase beretzono bizdon chayav karet. ואם היו שם עדים בהתראה נסכל, ואם עשה בשוגג חייב קורבן חצת קבוע, ואל דברי עם האסורין משום המשבות, יש מהן שלוקין עליהן מכת מרדות, ויש מהן שעשו לכתחילה בלבד, ואין לוקין עליהן כלל. This is uh, coming from Shabbat in Hay. I'm with Rish Chaf Bet in the Siman over there. Okay, so we're talking about here. I'll, I'll translate it into English, friends. This, by the way, this Yal Kut Yosef book, I very much recommend everyone to purchase. It's a set of three on Hilchot Shabbat. Actually, I know one of the people that uh, I'm friendly with, the son-in-law of uh, one of the authors of this book over here. It's a revised edition over here, the Saka edition over here. So I'll say it in English over here, friends. The Torah commands us to rest on Shabbat. And as I stated before, the verse in Shemot, uh, chapter 23, uh, Pasuk number 12 says, you must rest on the seventh day. One who performs an act of Malacha on Shabbat is guilty of ignoring this mitzvah. Furthermore, he is guilty of transgressing the command of the Torah do not perform any melacha. Naturally, we said before, there's 39 melachot workings on Shabbat. We are not allowed to do. Anyone who willfully performs an act of melacha on Shabbat while aware that it's forbidden is liable for a specific punishment called karet, which I will expound on in later times. It's a punishment, a spiritual exposition, uh, I think is a word that has been, I've seen used exactly to describe that. It's like, say, uh, for example, a... Uh, it could be, God forbid, a premature death uh, or, and an eternal punishment in the world to come. That's how severe it is and not to be taken lightly at all, obviously. And during those times that the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was a Jewish court that was around at the time of the Beta Mikdash, functioned alongside the Holy Temple in Yerushalayim, was based in Yerushalayim. If there happened to be, over here, two witnesses warn someone of consecra- uh, the consequences of being Mechalel Shabbat, desecrating Shabbat, and then watched him do so, he would be liable for punishment of skila, which is one of the forms of uh, capital punishment in the time of the Beta Mikdash, which is basically stoning, basically. If someone performed an act of malacha on Shabbat because he did not realize it was forbidden, they call this shogeg, not mazid. Mazid is something, if you do, which is purposeful. If you do something b'shogeg, that is, if it's done, let's say, with an element of mistake to it, he is required to bring a korban over here. What is this korban, friends? A lamb as a sacrifice to achieve atonement for this act. So he will bring a korban to mechaper 
this uh, transgression is done, which we very much learned in Ab Hashat Vaikra and Sefer Vaikra. Even if some forms an act forbidden only by the Rabbanan, by the rabbis, the sages themselves enacted uh, things that would be forbidden to do on Shabbat. So if someone is going to actually transgress something that the rabbis enacted, he may be liable to also potentially with lashes, to suffer lashes from the rabbinic court. There are other acts for which the court administers no punishment at all, but they are forbidden by our sages. So some of these acts which are forbidden by the sages might not get a specific physical punishment according to the code of Jewish law. So number two, halacha bet in the klalim, but melachot shabbat. Okay, so now we're talking about din ha'oseh melacha b'shinui. Say, for example, you could be doing something with a shinui on Shabbat. Shinui is something where you're not doing it the natural way, where you're removing an object its natural way. You're doing it with a change to it, something that there's like this recognition that there's something different about it. So I'll expound on that now. And this halacha bet. Lo asra Torah ele melachat machshebet. Lefi chach ha'oseh melacha ha'asura b'shabbat, shlo kederech asiyata b'chol. This uh, phrase we use, which is symbolizing also a shinui, this kind of change. It's, you're not going to be, uh, it's not going to be chayav from a biblical prohibition. Through the sages. What's this saying? Through the elbow. He's going to be exempt if he does this sort of shinui. Okay, so I'll translate that in English for you, friends. Halacha number two. The Torah forbids, it, it, they uh, forbid on Shabbat, only acts that are melechet machshevet. What is that? That's acts that are considered important full-fledged acts when you're actually using uh, your full uh, brain. Therefore, if someone for, performs an act of melacha in an abnormal manner, say he does it through his elbow, we talked about before, <coughs> you could do it with a change, something which he doesn't usually do. He has not performed an act forbidden on Shabbat itself by the Torah. It's not a uh, Doraita, as they call it. When you do an act that's forbidden from the Torah, it's called Doraita. If it's an act that's forbidden from the rabbis, it's the Rabbanan. Therefore, it is forbidden only by our sages to write while holding the pen on the back of one's hand. Say, for example, he's going to use the back of the hand. Or with one's foot, which you don't usually do. You don't usually write to your foot. You only maybe the clowns in the circus will do that. Or with the mouth or the elbow. So... Someone go, goes like that to right, you know, that's, uh, that's not normal way. The rule applies to all of the 39 melachot of Shabbat, which we can learn about. So I'll go on to Gimel now. Shnaima osim melacha b'Shabbat, einam chayvim mina Torah. Umikol makom adirabbanan asu. When, so basically in natural, when two people are doing a melacha together at the same time, they're not going to be chayav from the Torah, but they're going to be chayav uh, from an enactment of the rabbis, which we uh, will explain. Okay, now we're going to talk about something called garama. Okay, this is, garama is indirect acts of melacha. This is a halacha dalad in this uh, general uh, rules of the halacha over here. Lo asra Torah, ela asiyat melacha mamash. Aval garama eina asura mina Torah. This grama, when you do an act, that is indirect. It's not forbidden from the Torah. Element Rabbanan ba'alma. Only it's uh, forbidden uh, from the rabbis. The rabbis forbade it. Okamo shilamdu chachamim, which we learn, I believe, in Mesechet Shabbat on Kuf Chaf in Tractate Shabbat. Lo tase kol melacha asiya hu da'asira. Ha garama sharia. Okay, so what it's talking about there. The Talmud actually teaches in Mesechet Shabbat, in page 120, over there in Kuf Chaf, you must not do acts of melacha, that only performing acts of melacha directly are forbidden by the Torah, and not indirect acts of garama. So if it's an indirect act, which you've done, it's not forbidden from the Torah. So that's uh, you know, tidbit number four. Now we're going on to Halacha Hey over here. So what's that saying over here? There's a Yesh Omrim, where some other opinions are going to say. Yesh Omrim, Shubimelechet Mevashel Gam Garama Chayav. Shaharei Kol Ikara Shel Melacha Zohi Begarama. Yesh Omrim, She'ein Lecha Bo Ela Chidusho, Velo Asra Torah Ela Hanachat Hakteira Al Esh Vilvad. Av Shatavshil Mitvashel Bolech Maala. So friends, what's it saying over here? In halacha number five, it says over here, some of the rabbis, some of the poskim, 
They rule that the above rule does not apply to the Melecha of Bishul. When it comes to what's Bishul, friends, it's cooking. And we know that I'm going to expound on later on that cooking could be through Esh, through fire. It could be through uh, liquid medium or through other things. It could be for, through frying or through roasting. But according to some opinions, one is not going to, uh, this, uh, 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 it's going to rule that it doesn't apply necessarily to cooking. The reason why is this, that every act of cooking itself is a garama. The whole act of cooking is a garama itself. Since someone who places the food over the fire and then it cooks by itself, and then the Torah forbids this, even though it is called a garama over here. Therefore, they concluded that even if someone would indirectly cause a food to become cooked, he has transgressed a Torah prohibition over here. However, there's other poskim, other rabbanim that are going to say they're going to disagree on this over here. And what they're going to say, that although it is true that every case of cooking on Shabbat is by nature an act of garama, still the Torah forbids only a direct act of making a food get cooked over here. An indirect act that ends up causing food to be cooked is not forbidden by the Torah, according to this specific opinion over here. The halacha follows the second opinion over here, which we've just said. So the second, the latter opinion is going to take pre preference. So we're talking about cooking here. Now we will go on to halacha vav over here. Marsh patro grama b'shabat hu gam grama b'melechet zora. Okay, so friends, what we're talking about here in Halacha 6. So likewise, someone who, through an indirect act of grammar, performs the Malacha of Zoreya. Zoreya is another Malacha, one of the 39 Malachot, which we'll expound on more. It's, what's it called, Zoreya? It's called sewing over here. So someone that's going to perform sewing, this kind of act, on Shabbat, is not guilty of performing an act forbidden by the Torah. Why is this? This is despite the fact that every act of Malacha of Zorea, of sowing, is really an indirect act, we say. It's kind of a grammar element to it itself. Since a person sows the seed today, and only after several days, it will strike root. So it's not an instant thing where you see, where you do a Malacha, say for example, another one of writing, Kotev, it's instant, you see the thing automatically. But when you're sowing something, it reaps the benefits only at a later period later. <clears throat> okay, so now we are going to do Zayim. Yesh Omrim Shemutali Grom B'Shabbat L'Asiyat Dava Asu Medivrei Sofrim Ukegon Latet Kli Tachat Ashuchan Shanei Taloi Ma'alab Ba'od Yom Ubeshabbat Notel Et Ashuchan Ba'Kli Omed Ma'atzmo Tachat Anel V'Nimsa Gorem Levatel Kli Mechena Dolo Asru Chachamim Gram B'Shabbat Elav Melacha Asura Min Atura Aval Lo B'Melacha Asura Medirabanan V'Yesh Cholkim V'Omrim so friends, what's it saying over here in Halakha number 7? We're saying that some poskim, some of the rabbis actually ruled that our sages, the rabbonim, forbade us from performing acts of Malacha through Garama only if the act would be forbidden by the Torah, if it was performed directly. So we're talking about a direct act, then it will be uh, forbidden. However, it is, let's say, permissible, however, to indirectly bring about an act that is forbidden by our sages to perform directly. So if it's direct versus indirect, over there. It's forbidden. Now, they give an example, friends, over here. It's forbidden by our sages, over here, to, on Shabbat, to place a bowl under a lit oil lamp on Shabbat in order to catch the oil that might drip from the lamp, since this oil over here is considered muktzeh. And it will cause the bowl itself, this intrinsic bowl itself, to become muktzeh itself. So in those days, they didn't have light electronic switches where you can switch on before Shabbat or do a time switch. So you actually use the oil itself and it could become muktzeh and go inside the bowl. And that bowl itself will become muktzeh where you can't touch. However, if the lamp is suspended over a table, let's just say, one may place a bowl under the table and then remove the table leaving the bowl directly under the lamp where it will catch the dripping oil. So there's an advice here. Okay, if you use this tactic, according to uh, the al Yosef, to the Shulchan Aruch here, where it might be permissible. Other poskim, however, there's other rabbis are going to rule over here that an act of grama that brings about something that our sages have prohibited is forbidden as well. So this grama itself 
is forbidden. In a case where there are other reasons for leniency, a rabbi may combine the lenient opinion regarding karama to enforce this lenient ruling. So sometimes if you need a leniency on many uh, of the halakhic rulings, you can ask your rabbi and see if there's a heter to do this. It could be an oppressed need. One would do it in a tzorich witness situation where you need it. Maybe we'll, we'll guess around you will have to consult your rabbi on that. Let's try to do a few more halakhot before we finish this first episode. We're on chet now over here in the general rules of the halakhot of Shabbat. So we're talking about that uh, in a case where there could be a great need, a hefset gadol, where you could end up losing a lot. For example, they give the example over here of a major loss where if a house is caught on fire, and in this case, no one's life is in, 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 in endangered over here. It is then it's going to be permissible. Let's say that no life is at risk. It's permissible to indirectly, indirectly cause the fire to be extinguished and save one's property over here. So that will be a case over there where it might be uh, fulfilled. This is in Halakha Chet over here. These are exterminating, exterminating circumstances, but you'll indirectly have to take out the fire through an indirect means, obviously naturally using water or something but once again a rabbi would have to be uh you have to be very well versed in this okay now in halakha teisha number tet number nine some poskim ruled that our sages the rabbis forbade okay uh, uh, an act of melacha through grammar only when one has intentions for the melacha to take place only if you actually thought about it if one has no intentions for the malacha to take place, then even though his actions make it inevitable that the malacha will take place, and it is a case of sikreshe, which we're going to expound on, then it will be permitted. Other poskim disagreed and ruled that it will be forbidden over here. I'll say it in Hebrew because I didn't say it. Yeshomrim, she lo asru chachamim grama b'shabbat. If it's a case of sikreshe over here, then it's not going to be asru forbidden according to the rabbis of the grammar of Shabbat. If you had intention over here, you thought in your brain over here that you're doing this melacha over here, and then it is going to be asur according to the chachamim. And then it is going to be asur according to the chachamim. But if you don't have any intention, if you didn't have intention within regards to this melacha of uh, which was forbidden, if you don't have any intention with regards to Yesh Cholkim. So according to that opinion, it will be mutar, but there are different opinions that will, uh, which will argue on this. Uh, by the way, all these halachot, I very recommend, I- I'm going to say now, don't rely on everything I'm saying. It's always good to look in the book yourself, to learn it yourself. Spend some time each day actually looking at the Yalkut yourself, which is, or at the Mishnah Barua, or whatever you are going to be using, and not just rely on this year. This is just an outline. It's just a uh, asset, which... Uh, we will do. We're going to now talk about the din mekalkel. Mekalkel is something that is a destructive, something that uh, destroys when you're doing an act itself. Now we're going to, there's just uh, three short halachot within regards to that and then we will draw up for the day. Yud, ha'oseh melacha derech hashchata v'kel kol patu aval asum divrei sofrim. If you can do a melacha, a job, some sort of work on Shabbat, where it's going to be in, done in a destructive way, over here, it's going to be, you're not going to be higher for it, obligated. You're not going to be, uh, have a punishment on it. But according to, uh, the rabbis itself, some of the sages, it is going to be forbidden over here. So, uh, you're not going to be over a Torah prohibition, but it's forbidden by our sages still. So one can't think like, say, for example, you've got something destructive and you're going to, ooh, zoos it on the table. If it's going to, it's going to destroy, it's not done the natural way, but still the rabbis will forbid it. Some people are going to say if you've got the combined factors of psikreshe and also mkulkal, the two together, then it's going to be permissible if you're going to do this act. Uh, but you can't also have intention for it over here. So the combination of psikreshe and mkalkel. Uh, is going to place and you must not have intention in performing the malacha. So there's three variables uh, that would, uh, let's say that some hoskim, I stress some hoskim, not everyone, will say is okay. You'd bet, last one for today, before we're going to conclude and draw up, 
Din Chetzi Shiu B'Shabbat. There's a concept of Chetzi Shiu Min HaTorah, which we learn about all over the Shulchan Aruch, not just in Hilchot Shabbat, it's, it, it's inclusive in other places also. Yesh Omrim, She'oseh Melacha B'Shabbat Ve'ein Ba Shiuch Yuva Melacha. So say, for every single uh, uh, Melacha you do, there's a specific amount, a measure you can do. Let's say we're talking about you only do half a measure of it, of this specific thing. Are you, is it going to be forbidden? It says over here, יש אומרים שעושה מלאכה בשבת ואין בה שיעור חיוב מלאכה, אין לו חיה מן התורה שאין איסור חצי שיעור מן התורה שייך בהלכות שבת. When it comes to הלכות שבת, חצי שיעור מן התורה is not going to be applicable over here, according to this יש אומרים. אלא באיסורי אכילה, this is only exclusive to food, to, to eating over here, which we we'll very much learn about in uh, the Hilchot of Yom Kippur, for example. ויש אומרים שאפילו מדרבנן אין לאיסור בזה, ויש אומרים שדין שבת שווה לשאר האיסורים, שחצי שיעור עשו מן התורה, וראוי לצרף את הסברה הראשונה, כשיש סניף נוסף להקל. So friends, what we're talking about over here, our sages taught that regarding many of the 39 מלאכות, and their toladot, which we can expound on, one would be guilty only if he performs the melacha to a minimum amount of material over here. There are three different opinions which uh, we're going to look at about the rule concerning performing an act of melacha to less than the minimum amount, the chetzi shiur over here. There's three uh, opinions here. I'll g- categorize it by A, B, and C using this book of uh, Yalkut Yosef. So A, some poskim ruled that the Torah permits this act but that our sages forbade any act of melacha, no matter how little material is involved over here, even if it's a small amount over here, it's going to be forbidden. They explained that although there is a Gemara rule, a Talmudic rule, that the Torah forbids any prohibited act, even if it's performed with such a minimum amount, that no punishment is forthcoming, that rule applies only to mitzvot, where the Torah forbids an act of eating over here. Regarding the Torah's prohibition, Against performing acts of melacha on Shabbat, however, the Torah did not forbid an act performed with less than a minimum punishable amount. So there's a specific am- punishable amount which the Torah has prescribed where someone would be over over here. B. Uh, bet. So what's bet saying? Some poskim ruled that even more leniently that such an act is always permissible and our sages never impose any restriction on it. That's according to a very lenient opinion here. You can see... Sorry about that. I'll just uh, hang up the phone. See, other poskim ruled that all these acts are forbidden by the Torah, that chetzi shu is forbidden regarding acts of melacha on Shabbat, just the same as chetzi shu is forbidden regarding prohibited food. So, uh, <coughs> it's, uh, some rabbonim are going to say this, this uh, din of chetzi shu, this half amount, is, it's not just exclusive within regards to eating, it's also within regards to Shabbat. So this is a strict opinion, C is. But it's important that over here, whenever someone wants a leniency in a specific topic, you have to always speak to a competent, competent, uh, competent Orthodox rabbi over here. Friends over here, I, I know many of you people are listening to this and uh, some might not be religious at all. Some might uh, 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 maybe be going to reform synagogues, a conservative synagogue. But over here, I'm telling you this with uh, tough love over here. It's important whenever you're getting halachic rulings to speak to a competent, orthodox Jewish rabbi within regards to these halachot. But we love all Jews and everything else uh, with our brothers and sisters. But over here, I uh, stress you've got to go to an orthodox, competent rabbi within regards to things. And sometimes, it, should a leniency be applied in some cases, should it not? Uh, that is uh, something you should ask your rabbi with regards, in many cases, I heard a very touching uh, story with regards to a soldier, only uh, yesterday, Rav uh, Diane Weiss actually related over, maybe I'll expound that in another video of the story he said over here. So please, I'm sending this out on social media, please like this video, please share this video to everyone else, it's a new series of Yalkut Yourself. As I stressed in my introduction, uh, a friend of mine, Rabbi Leo D., uh, his wife was murdered and two of his daughters. This was going back at the start of April during Pesach. This is Luni Nishmat for the Holy Souls over here, which I uh, related over in the other video. Let's just see Brachot in Israel. And Be'ez Rosh Hashem, there's going to be the rebuilding of the third Beit HaMikdash, where all these halachot we're going to learn, and many of these where we have to bring Korbanot, will actually not just be able to learn it in theory, but practice it itself. So wishing you all 
a good day. I'd like to dedicate this also, uh, Rufo Shlema, my sister-in-law that just gave birth, Mazal Tov to her. Her name is Ruth Rachel Bat Margalit. Bezrat Hashem, uh, just we'll see brachot and a full Rufo Shlema uh, after birth and uh, very quick and easy and healthy recovery. Wishing all a fantastic day here from Israel.